You know, because at the end of the day, what we're all looking for is not just how to improve customer experience, but where do you prioritize your investments so that you're making the biggest bang for your buck? Welcome to the Human Insight Podcast, where we help you bridge the empathy gap to bring you a valuable new understanding of some of the most innovative ideas and trends shaping the future of business and customer experience. I am Janelle Estes, Chief Insights Officer at User Testing, and today we've invited Susan Rice, VP of User Experience at Workiva. Thanks so much for joining us today, Susan, and welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. So you're currently the VP of UX at Workiva, which is a global SaaS reporting compliance platform that enables the use of connected data and automation of reporting across finance, accounting, risk, and compliance. Tell us a bit about your role today at Workiva, what you're focused on, and maybe even what keeps you up at night. Sure. And you said that way better than I could. Um, So thank you for the intro. (laughs) Yeah. So I head up the user experience team at Workiva. I joined about five months ago. I inherited a really awesome team of about 30 people and we're all focused on really what can we do to create the best experiences for our customers across our platform. And, you know, just recently, we are actually just coming out of a couple of weeks of hackathon, kind of a, a kickoff meets hackathon and just a really exciting time for us to to share kind of a three-year vision around what those experiences could look like longer term. So that's been really exciting to come together as a team and not just across UX, but across product engineering, all of us, you know, within R&D and share that with the broader team. So let's see, what keeps me up at night? Actually not work. So (laughs) what kept me up at night recently was I was, I feeling like I was the last person to have an appointment for the vaccine. So I, thankfully I have an appointment on Wednesday. So I'm super excited and I slept really well this weekend. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm assuming you booked it maybe late last week. So you were able to have a restful weekend. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I'm so glad that you elaborated on the hackathon being, uh, including UX product and engineering. Can you tell us a little bit about how that hackathon worked? Like how long was it and what was the final output? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it, it's what we call our link conference and it's for all of, of, of R&D and it's kind of a hackathon meets like a, an annual kickoff, which meets also a co- user conference kind of thing, um, all combined into two full weeks. So everyone takes two weeks off from their day to day, you know, for the most part, and then they can focus on completely new projects that will help us kind of be more innovative, think a little bit differently than we would, uh, you know, in our normal day to day with our, you know, typical sprints and what have you and kind of break out of the norm. It's been really exciting to see just the number of initiatives we have across the board. Some are very, very technical back end. Some are, you know, really like a different way to reach our customers better. Actually later today is when they do all of the, um, the share outs across the teams. And there's something like over 50 projects. Wow, that's amazing. And that's a that's a big investment for the company to make in, in something like this. And so that that that's awesome that you're able to to do that and have your team, you know, be involved in it. Yeah, it it is a big investment and I love it. You know, the company recognizes that it's important to break out of your day-to-day and to find new ways of working to unleash the potential. Yeah, absolutely. How did that work? I'm assuming this year. And perhaps even last year, but you weren't at the company at the time, this was all done remotely. So any tips or tricks around how (laughs) how that worked, you know, how you could do that type of activity remotely? Yeah. So last year, it was last minute remote. So they had already had plans to, you know, all meet in the same location, which is talk about the investment right now that we're talking about flying people from all over the country, um, some people outside of the country uh, into one location, but the last minute they had to change those plans. So I obviously wasn't here for that, but this year it was two full weeks of remote and it seemed to work really well. Such big kudos to the team that pulled together the event 
which were all people from R and D. Every day there were there were events such as coffee chats, events such as、um, a Slack only AMA. You know, ask me anything. So people would just throw in all these different questions for that person that was heading up the、um, you know that was the. Person answering all the questions, and it would just be an hour, just getting to know one another.、Uh, because part of this is really being able to also not just identify new opportunities and innovations, but just get to know other people within R and D. As we continue to grow and scale, it's just harder to have those conversations with people that you are not in your day to day. So I met so many different people through our donut Slack chats, you know, and coffee chats. It was really fun to just have conversations with you know the senior engineer over here or the Delivery manager over there, and and it really helps you identify new ideas and new thinking. And oh wow, you know, I need to follow up on this particular topic. I wouldn't have ever figured that out had I not had this really interesting conversation with this person. Yeah, that that's a that's a really great point in terms of to be able to make those personal connections. And now, when you have a question or an idea, you have now a person that you can go kind of chat with about it. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So you're running the UX team at Workiva. Tell us a little bit about the role of, of your team, and also maybe even what metrics or KPIs、uh, that your team either directly influences or perhaps even indirectly influences. We have a team of、um, specialists and generalists. It's actually interesting because I built my last two teams in this way, and then I was really fortunate to to join Workiva, and the teams were already set up in this way, and I can break that down a little bit. So what I mean is, we have UX designers, or if we want to call them product designers, we call them UX designers at Workiva. They're embedded with the squads, so they're a true triad <clears throat> between the you know lead engineer, the product manager, and then the UX designer,、um, really working together to solve a particular problem in a particular problem space. Now. You know, you have those UX designers that are all embedded, but there's also this opportunity to then take a step back and say, okay, well, we really want to understand our customers. How do we best go about doing that? Who are the the people that should be looking at that more broadly across the different journeys? Because if you have a UX designer who's focused on a space, they're not they're always going to be researching for that how to improve that area, that problem area. So. It's to me. There's a real big need to have research that cuts across and looks at things more broadly and holistically, and then can feed into any given squad, for instance. But there's there's even bigger opportunities that can help drive product strategy or organizational strategy, for that matter. So we have separate re-、uh, researchers for that reason, and then we also、um, look to content design and UI design for those specializations as well. You might be a UX designer. You might do some writing, of course. However, are you the best in really understanding how that should be communicated and what the content strategy opportunity is across what you're solving for? And again, like thinking about that holistically, that's what helps us have these these special specialized roles that can think about how this one particular change fits into the broader ecosystem. Uh, within the Workiva platform, and how that really truly meets customers' needs broadly from an experience perspective, end to end. Same thing with UI design, which our teams both help elevate the visual design and the aesthetic of the the you know of、uh, a given experience, but also、um, really deep dive into design the design system and what work we could do there. So that's how our team kind of is made up. And you know, really intending to be very collaborative across the board and enablers to one another for ultimately creating those great experiences. And now I for, totally forgot what you also asked. Oh, KPIs.、Um, <laughs> sorry, about that. we're really fortunate. That we have shared KPIs across not just R and D but across the company. To me, that's critical for success. You know, in creating really great customer experiences. Again, end to end, thinking about the journey all the way from before you've even acquired that customer, once they've onboarded, once they're you know using the software day in, day in and day out or infrequently, and then you know. Hopefully not the offboarding, but、um, but to have CSAT essentially is our you know that's our our metric is it's super helpful because then it kind of puts aside some of the barriers that you might have if you have conflicting KPIs, which you know I've experienced before, 
And it's not uh, the easiest thing necessarily to, to manage through because then, you know, we're not really putting the customer at the center of what we do. So CSAT is really awesome. And it's a great leading indicator ultimately of how we can expand on our customers, right? Revenue expansion, as well as revenue growth. And the company really sees that value. Yeah, that's great. And your point around having a metric, one that is the same across groups, but also customer focused versus what you care about as a business. Now, of course, what you care about as a business is also important, but reframing it around the customer uh, can really, you know, it sounds like a really simple thing, but it really does change uh, the way teams think about their work. Yeah. And how they operate together. For the CSAT, do you look at, you know, a single score across the journey or are you looking at different parts of the journey and do you have CSAT attached to each part of the journey? So we look at CSAT in a number of different ways, but, um, you know, at the highest level, it's based on kind of the customer base we're serving. So all rolled up into that, but we break that down to better understand parts of the journey to help us um, identify and prioritize areas we should continuously improve. And so we run like ongoing experience surveys, for instance, is just one way to capture that and better understand kind of, you know, because at the end of the day, what we're all looking for is not just how to improve customer experience, but where do you prioritize your investments so that you're making the biggest bang for your buck. So we're continuously trying to implement new ways to um, prioritize and just give us greater confidence that what we're going to be building is going to move the needle. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Speaking of CSAT and really thinking about how you collect customer feedback and continually stay close to your customers, which sounds like is part of the strategy and culture at Workiva. You know, this year has been interesting in terms of, well, actually more than a year now, close to 15 months. You know, we've had to approach that a little bit differently, uh, given everyone working from home. How have you and your team stayed close to customers when being in person uh, is and face-to-face is really not an option? We're using Zoom more often or Google Meet and uh, we're having, we're still having those, you know, one-on-one interviews. I actually ran some customer focus groups last week. Focus groups are not like typically um, a methodology I use often. However, it was just um, beneficial for us to get some quick feedback on some, you know, longer term concepts with some of our customer advisory board members. You know, it's the first time I've run a focus group, (laughs) you know, remotely. So I wasn't exactly sure how to go about doing that, but I just figured, okay, well, you know what, let's just make it a smaller group. I'll have to just be that much more prepared with kind of who am I going to call out for what type type of questions, you know, just have a little bit more setup in that process. Um, And also just kind of asking for their patience through it that we're, you know, and I was just honest and like, oh, this is kind of the first time we've done a focus group online. But so let's just see how this goes. Uh, I'll be calling on you for certain things. And, you know, and and it it ended up being really great, honestly. Um, Like anything, the second day was better than the first day because I learned how to do that a little bit better. But it's all manageable. It really is. Um, is it exactly the same as being a person? Of course not, because there's a lot, it's a lot harder to recognize, you know, there's just some of the body language and what have you, but it's still, it still really works. So this shouldn't be slowing any of us down from conducting customer research. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've seen teams become much more nimble with uh, remote, remote methods and remote platforms like you mentioned. And I can imagine some of the features that are in Zoom or some of these other uh, technologies allow you to facilitate the meeting in a way that you couldn't actually do in person. So some of the polling and some of the collaboration features, and quite honestly, we all know, um, or, or perhaps those that are listening that have ever run a focus group before, there tends to be one or two that uh, sort of lead the discussion. And, you know, now you have technology to help you moderate those discussions, which you you just didn't have when you, or you don't have when you do it in person. Yeah. I mean, one time I ran a focus group with something like, I don't even know, maybe it was 12 people. 
<laughs> in person. I'm not sure I got, you know, it, it's, it was a whole different beast and that's kind of manageable, but at the same time, were there 11 people at any given time not bored? I don't know. So it just makes you rethink how you're going about doing these things to get the most out of the learnings and the insights. And so um, it, it, it worked for us, honestly. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so prior to work, Eva, you were at Toast, uh, which is based in Boston. And then before that, you were at Mind, Body, and, and Vistaprint. So you've been in both B2C and B2B environments, and in some cases, even B2B2C. <laughs> um, so in your opinion, is there a difference between user experience in B2B versus B2C? And if so, what, what are those differences? It's like yes and no at the same time. The reality is for B2B environments where, you know, it's specifically about those experiences where customers are living and breathing your your products on your platform, the ones where they're you know in it all day long. So there might be some B2B software where you're, they're in and out, and that's probably a lot closer to a B2C experience. But for customers like ours at Workiva, where they have Workiva open all day long, they are using you know our spreadsheet functionality. They are looking at hundreds of lines of data and they're comparing it to another document. They're moving information around that sort of thing, but they're living on our platform. That is a very different, they're very different needs than a consumer who's just opening up an app in there for two seconds to do one thing and then popping back out. You know, it, from that perspective, it's different in that, you know, you have to think about information density. So where consumers experiences are very like white, lots of white space, lots of, you know, you can see you barely have that much information that you need to see on any given screen. That is very different. I've, we've tried that before <laughs> taking like just rows of tables and really giving it a lot more breathing room and our customers, not, not here at Workiva, but previously in previous lives, they've been like, oh my God, I can't see as much information. I needed to see this much. Right. So you have to take those um, details into into account and figure out like how much information is kind of the right information given what they are trying to accomplish in their day with your product. And then how do you balance that with making it as easy to read and digest and easy, you know, you still want it to be easy to access. And so there's a lot more considerations from that perspective, but then if you boil it down, like it still is like, how do you make complexity as simple as possible. That's still true for consumers or for businesses. It's just that that complexity or what how you simplify depends on how well you know the customers and what, what this job is that they're trying to get done. That's where it's like, okay, the same concepts apply, how you apply them can be very different. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I've also heard some pretty bold statements around how people will take the best B2C experience that they've had and expect your B2B experience to sort of emulate that or deliver on some of the same levels of delight, let's call it. What do you think about that? It's just, you know, not that simple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll go as far to say it's like designing for consumers is easier. I'm just going to say that. It's easier. But the thing about that is that they don't necessarily have to use your software or your app, right? So their tolerance is lower, right? So for their, they just have a lower tolerance for bad experiences because they can just very easily drop you like a bad habit because there's going to be some other, <laughs> some other competitor, some other app that will probably offer something similar enough and people talk and all those kinds of things. So, so it's just, a, they're different from that perspective that you can't just take a consumer experience and say, let's just plop that down into um, this B2B, very, you know, a complex situation where again, if somebody's living and breathing your software, there's a lot more you need to understand in terms of what it is they're trying to accomplish. And then how do we best help them accomplish that? What delights a consumer might not be the same thing that delights somebody you know, from a B2B standpoint. So, you know, a user that's there every day. So it's it's just not that simple, but now can we take some of the, the that thinking and some of the, um, you know, ex 
experiences of, oh, there are moments of delight. Can you add moments of delight into B2B experiences? Absolutely. You just need to figure out what's actually going to be valuable to your customers to identify what is delight for them. Yeah, delight is is two very different things in, in B2C versus B2B. And arguably the tolerance level for delight is probably not the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> Switching gears here a little bit, you've had the opportunity to lead uh, teams across a handful of companies over the last 15 plus years. And I don't know about you, but a lot has changed over the the last 15 years for me in terms of how I've seen the space evolve. Um, So I'm curious your take on that. What's changed over the, the years that you've been running teams and perhaps even what's remained the same? Yeah. So let's see. What's changed? I mean, some of the things that are changed is just the amount of, well, actually, I mean, so we went to grad school together at um, Bentley. And when I went to, I don't know about you, when I was there, I just loved this notion of user-centered design, which is why I pursued getting my master's in the first place. You know, I took the two-day course at first for human factors with Bill Gribbins, and I thought, oh my God, a certificate is not good enough. I really want to like, I want to learn everything about this topic. It's just like mind blown. Of course, we should be prototyping and testing and learning before we write any lines of code. You know, I went into it because I wanted to learn. I had zero idea that it was going to blow up the way it did in terms of our field becoming so big and becoming such an integral part of software development. Like I had no idea at that point. <laughs> did you? Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. And it was, it's, it's been really gratifying to be honest with you to see, I call it like, I don't know if you felt this way when you went, went to grad school and came out with your kind of set of skills and expertise, but it was almost like this little superpower you had and no one really knew about quite yet, but everybody was starting to catch on to and understand the importance of it. And then you just see the acceleration of this over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And it's like, wow, yeah, pretty incredible. It is incredible. So when I think about it from those days, I'm like, wow, it really, it's the expansion has been incredible. It's been uh, just nothing I had imagined whatsoever. I didn't even think that far into the future at that point. (laughs) (laughs) So that's obviously, you know, just the amount of just the amount of, you know, focus of having these, you know, user experience being such a core piece of a business at this point, which, you know, people say they're still not UX still doesn't have a seat at the table, what have you. But I mean, when you look back at 10, 15 years ago, I mean, we've come a long way. We've come a really long way. Um, And so, you know, to be able to walk into a company like Rakiva, for instance, I feel super fortunate because UX was already embedded within the teams. It's really thought as a key part of that triad. And, and, you know, again, in in making really and creating really great experiences that are going to bring value, not just to the customers, but then ultimately to the company. And so to even just be able to have this, like this position in this company that already values UX, well, that just, that doesn't always happen. (laughs) And it certainly wasn't a thing 10 years ago. So that's huge. You know, and then thinking about like just some other changes that are happening because of this continued growth within our field and the continued recognition that it is valuable. There's been just this like crazy growth in the number of of universities, boot camps, uh, right, undergrad, grad schools, all these like schooling, all the schooling now um, and education And that's been huge, Um, but it's been this interesting dynamic that it's created of a lot of new people, people who are, you know, new into UX coming out of these programs and then looking for those entry-level positions that are few and far between. So that's another interesting dynamic that's happening and that's changed a lot as well. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Any ideas or or tips for for people that are in that, in that place? You know, I, it was on a podcast a few months ago now, and it was really focused on people who are career switching from another profession over to UX, but it's sort of a similar conundrum where, you know, you're coming out with a certain level of education, yet not a ton of practical experience. So how do you go about breaking into the, the UX field when you're, when you're, at, you know, when you're there in your career? 
it's hard. I'm not going to pretend like it's not hard. I actually have been mentoring people through the ADP list um, up until recently. I just have been taking a little bit of a break to really focus on my role now. Uh, but I, I, spoke to something like 70 people last year, and they were all coming from a very similar position of, oh, I'm in, you know, I'm, I'm just finishing up school now, and I'm just trying to find my new role, or I'm a career changer, all those things that you just mentioned. And so, you know, it's, it is a challenge. So my, my recommendation is if there's any way for you to get hands-on experience before you graduate, right? Uh, the internships, um, you know, any kind of apprenticeship side, volunteer, volunteering, whatever you can do, even, you know, and, and if you've already graduated, if you can even find those roles also with nonprofit orgs or, um, you know, the, the city, whatever that looks like, that's going to be really helpful to help, you know, because you, you need to differentiate yourself somehow with the masses that are coming out of, you know, undergrad again, and, and these programs. So the more hands on you can be and have more and practical experience in your portfolio, the the better your situation will be. But quite frankly, I think it is a little bit tough because there are a lot of positions available. It's not like there's not a lot of openings. It's just that the way that companies or startups where they're focused is a lot of times they need somebody to just drop in and already have that experience to help them accelerate their growth or in a startup situation, be the first designer. And so they can't put that bet on a first designer that's never designed before. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So it puts both, both parties in interesting positions. Uh, I agree with that advice though, building up your portfolio with really practical kind of examples. And I've even seen some people just get really creative with, you know, you know, just do sort of an evaluation of an existing experience or go redesign something that is interesting to you um, and show your thought process there. So even if it's not for hire, you know, pulling out and showcasing your skills that way. Yeah. You know, for researchers, I think sometimes you think about designer portfolios, but it's also beneficial to have researcher portfolios as well. Yeah. And you can easily do that with, you know, as you're mentioning with the evaluations and what have you. All right. So switching gears a little bit here, it sounds like the, the sort of culture that you entered at Workiva, uh, the case for UX um, was certainly built in the past. And so you inherited, you know, a culture that I'm sure is in a great place, although I'm sure it could always, always be better. Maybe even thinking back to other companies or, or how you plan to accelerate the importance of UX at Workiva, help, help me understand um, how you go about doing that, building the case for UX. Like, Do you focus on speaking the language of the business? Do you focus on storytelling and narratives of customers? Um, or, or do you have other tactics that you think are helpful when you're when you're trying to build the case for uh, investing in user experience? I'm like, yes to all the things. Um, <laughs> so it really depends. I don't know. Like, can you go through any conversation about UX and not say that? <laughs> it is a very common phrase we use for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you're what you're asking about is how do you drive change, behavior change, you know, and so how you go about doing that is you have to first understand current state of the situation, the key stakeholders, executives, if that's the case, uh, the culture, uh, what's, what's working, what's not working, where's the opportunity, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, all those kinds of things, because there's not like one thing that's going to work. There's no silver bullet for driving investment into UX or, you know, getting that seat at the table. It's not one thing because it really depends on the context. So, you know, you put your researcher's hat on, <laughs> you, you figure out what is, you know, what, what is that, what's working today, what's happening and where's the opportunity. You're really trying to pinpoint and identify where is the opportunity. And then you shape your communication and you shape that story because it is, it's storytelling around that you create a strategy that ultimately you feel like would work because you've identified some of this kind of like the background information, the things that are going to help set you up for success, essentially. That's why it really, it's all very different. There's no like one way. Yeah, it's very, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's very, it varies based on the team, 
the existing customer culture, uh, sorry, the existing culture around customers and, and customer experience or user experience. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, executive buy-in has a, has a big part to do with it. The systems and tools that you already have in place, perhaps even if there's governance around it, like, you know, it's, it, there are a lot of things that kind of go, go into that. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, how much support do you have, you know, with other peers or, you know, can you build a coalition of people that can help support that, what you want to help drive forward with how much access do you have to the people that make certain types of decisions like the CEO. So it's also varied. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And it's almost like you have to, at least when you first enter a new team uh, or a new company, it's like, you know, to your earlier point, you almost have to put on your researcher hat and do some level of assessment and understanding like the context and who your end user is in all of this and how you're going to package up what's going on today and where you want to go from here. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like you said, there's no silver bullet. That's for sure. No, no. But if you know user-centered design, then you just practice it right? Within the organization, you practice it, you start with research, you start with understanding current state of, you know, any, everything. And you really, I mean, honestly, you just have to put your listening ears on big time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. So we're going to move into lightning questions. These are meant to just be kind of fast and whatever comes to mind, uh, feel free to uh, share, share whatever surfaces. Uh, what's a book you've recently read that you'd recommend to listeners? Well, depending on where, you know, where you're focused and what have you, um, I'm in the middle of Jobs to Be Done by Jim Callback. So having read different articles and, and what have you previously, it's funny, I'm also halfway as of last night through, I don't know if you saw that, but the debate between Jim and Jared Spool about jobs to be done. So I'm halfway through that as well. So um, I'm interested to hear about the, the second half of that. But um, yeah, jobs to be done has been really great for our organization. And we're, um, we're actively introducing that into WorkKiva so that we can really take an agnostic approach to understanding our, our customers and the opportunities they have, because not because of how, where WorkKiva sits in, you know, in terms of that in, in terms of that picture, but that we can just identify opportunities regardless and agnostic to our platform to help us unlock even new things we hadn't considered previously. So this is just, I find the book is really practical, you know, actionable, all those things. And it's been helpful for us as we're in this, the jobs we done journey for us. That's great. Yeah. Jim, uh, Jim is great. He's over at Mural now. Um, or actually he's been there for, for yeah. quite a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's awesome. I, I need to pick up that book. Um, I know about the jobs to be done framework. And I think it's fantastic to sort of frame things up again, like around what your customers are trying to accomplish, not what the business is focused on, uh, can be a really good way for framing things up for the team. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's something that we can all rally around behind uh, across different departments. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's one of those frameworks that seems to be well known and adopted outside of. UX, right? Which I think is important for us when we're trying to share, have a common language across other teams that we're working with. Yeah, exactly. And that's um, part of that debate between Jim and, and, um, uh, and Jared is whether or not this is just user-centered design, just wrapped up in a different picture and what have you. And I'm, I'm on the gym camp so far, but like I said, I'm halfway through <laughs> that, that debate. So yeah, to me, it goes back to, so whether, you know, it's a gimmick as, as Jared was pointing out in the first half, it goes back to that notion of, you know, what, like, what's going to resonate with your organization? Because at the end of the day, if we're trying to become more and more customer centric and put a customer at the center, then that's what should matter. And then we should use whatever tools we can to help us get there. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, we could probably talk a bit about this and maybe we, we don't include this part in the podcast, uh, given it's controversial, but I just, I sometimes feel like we can be a little too precious. If we want to remain relevant, we have to play nicely yeah, and be collaborative versus trying to like have this little 
special area that no one can can really touch that supposedly is different from everything else every other team works on. But really, when you pull it back, we're all saying the same thing, we're just saying it differently based on what discipline we're in. Right. So then why does it matter as long as we're getting to the outcome we're all driving towards, right? Exactly. Having that kind of thinking, that just is never working, right? That just doesn't work. Or this is like just for us, or we own this and and let, let us tell you how to go about doing that. Just like, that's just not how great things get done. Right. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. And you see that you see the world shifting, the world as in the at least the teams that I'm interfacing with, and you talk about shifts over the last five, 10 years, it, we've gone from a place where, you know, this is very protected to opening things up a little bit more and giving more people access to the powers, right? <laughs> um, but it's a slow process. And there are still many teams that are still kind of working through, do we do this? Or what does it look like? And how do we remain confident that this is still you know, valid, even though we're not making every decision related to every, you know, everything related to UX. It's fascinating. It is. And I'm sure it's just part of our journey Agree. As a field um, because we've been so um, having to kind of feel like we've had to fight to get to that seat at that table. I think that's what it's created is that Sometimes as you're describing, like whether it's this like, oh, this precious thing, it's like we, we it's as a, as a field, we don't have that confidence to say like, hey, you know what, we're, we're, we're just working all together. We're all just in this place because so many of us are still fighting to get to be of equal seating, of equal footing with these other disciplines. And so I think it just creates those strange dynamics that are just not necessarily the healthiest, but hopefully, you know, you would expect that those would diminish over time. Yeah. I think that you're absolutely right. It's like, we've clawed our way here, right? It's like, you're not giving up so easily once you get there. Yeah. All right. So a piece of advice that you might give to someone who's trying to convince others to invest in customer centric design. Yeah. Show don't tell. The worst thing you can do is you're, you come into a team and or a company and you're like pounding your chest and saying like, Oh, you need to do all these things and make all these changes, you know, in this particular way for UX and you need to do this and you need to do that. And the reason why I say that, and I, I'm not even joking about that whatsoever is because I've come into teams multiple times over where that was the case. And now I've inherited that situation and having to like manage through it with the stakeholders and the, you know, executives and what have you that, uh, that had experienced that type of UX leader. So I know it's a real thing. So you know, really what's most helpful is where can you show instead of telling people why certain user-centered design practices and what have you can be beneficial to the organization. So if that means going in quietly at first and just kind of trying to stay under the radar for a little while so that you can build up those those cases, then great, then do that. Maybe there, maybe it works for some people where they come in banging on their chest. It's just, again, I've not seen that work super effectively. And I've literally had to clean up those situations on multiple accounts. This is a kind of a fun one. So you think that there's a plethora of bad experiences we can always tear down and give feedback around, oh, why did you think, why, why is this being presented this way? Or did they think, you know, did they, you know, where was UX and all of this? I, you know, you've probably seen all the the silly and and funny memes about different examples. I would love to hear from you if you've had a recent experience that you thought was really great or spectacular, regardless of if it was at work or in a consumer experience, anything that pops to mind. I don't know about spectacular. <laughs> I didn't think when's the last time I had like a spec. I'm sure there's somewhere. This last year has been so strange though. So yeah, no, I had a, a little delightful experience. I would say I have continuously still trying to build up my office, um, you know, and, and just make it like just right. So I bought a couple of things for my desk, including a new laptop stand. I just found one that, you know, I think it ended up being from Etsy. And so really easy in terms of 
finding it, ordering it. I didn't really pay attention to how long it would take to get here, but it was here in just like, I want to say only a few days. Uh, so I was surprised by that, how, you know, how seamless the whole experience was, how quick, um, you know, to receive it. And I, I forgot <laughs> what I ordered and I got this like flat package and I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. I have no idea. So I opened it up and, and it's like, oh, it's this laptop stand. That's right. And it comes in three pieces and um, you just put it together, you know, in, in a particular way. It's three little like pieces. It probably might have come from a laser machine or something like that, a 3D laser printer. So anyways, and it's bamboo and what have you. But I, it was just really, it was really nice how I could just very easily look at their three pieces, you know, put it together without having to look at the instructions, which they did have really nice visual instructions also. The quality seems really nice for, you know, for the price. So it was really good value. It looks good on my desk. It fits exactly the way I want it to. It's right at the same, the right height. So I'm like, oh, that was a really just super easy, seamless, delightful experience. If only all software could be like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That that's that is a really good example and especially the part around putting it together. I find that that can be kind of a you know, when you look at the whole journey of purchasing something and getting it and getting to a place where you can actually use it, like usually the low point is when you get it and you get the instructions and you've got to put it together. So, yes. that is uh certainly not uh, by accident, I'm sure it was a very thoughtful process to put that together. Yeah, they did a really nice job. The fact that there also was those visual instructions, you know, it, it just, I don't, it obviously helps so much. I mean, you know, and I could do it without the instructions, but it helps really when you can do something visually that way. Cause sometimes you get those written instructions and I, I honestly, it makes my head hurt. I usually just hand that over to my son and my husband to figure it out. I can relate. I uh, remember getting a, a stand for under our TV over the summer and it took me three days, two hours at a, at a time to put this thing together. It was um, like, and then by the time it was done, it was all wobbly. And I'm like, all of this work. And now here we are. Uh, so of course, like, you know, um, I had to get help to get that uh, straightened out. It's still in my living room too. And like the door is still a little bit crooked. And every time I look at it, I'm just like, oh, Oh, God, I hate those kinds of things where you're like reminded day in and day out. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Let's talk about the future. When, When you think about the future, I mean, we've come a long way in terms of the field of user experience and customer driven design. Looking forward to, you know, the years ahead, what, what are you most excited about? I guess I'm excited about some of what we were talking about earlier about our field in general and the direction that we're headed in our field and how much progress we've made and continuously make. Really in the last couple of years or even just even, maybe it was this pandemic, I don't know. But you know, a couple of years ago, um, maybe even less, I did not see a lot of women in particular in these VP of UX roles. First off, there weren't a lot of VP of UX roles in the first place. There was that. And then I did a count. I want to say it was like less than two years ago. I did a count of how many women I knew in VP positions in kind of like the Boston area, for instance. And it was like two so I actually reached out to one of them because I just reached out to her via LinkedIn because I'm not afraid of those things. <laughs> I do things like that all the time. And I just said like, hey, you know, I would love to just learn a little bit more about like your position, your role and all these things. I love the fact that you're female in this VP role and there are very few. And I'm also in this this leadership Slack group for UX and that has a, you know, an all um, female non-binary group of people. And I'm sure they would love to learn from you and that sort of thing. So, you know, I, it was really top of mind for me a couple of years ago and then kind of time just, you know, flew by. And then suddenly I just see so many more positions generally at the executive level, but then also I see that many more women in positions as well. So just even that progress has been really exciting. And I want to continue to see that. I'd, I'd love to see that both from a uh, from a diversity perspective, but also from a, a leveling perspective where we see more in the C-suite. Um, that's not my goal personally, 
<laughs> but uh, but I, like I would love to see it for those where it is something that they uh, you know um, where people want to drive towards that kind of position because it would really say that we've we've come that much further along as a as a field as a discipline. I think that's just super exciting. Yeah, that's a fantastic way to sort of wrap this up. It's just sort of like, you know, seeing the the progression over time, but then also seeing diversity and leadership that are re- representing mm-hmm. the practice. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of good things kind of coming together. That's for sure. All right, Susan, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation and it's been so nice to reconnect and um, best of luck in your role at Workiva. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. It was just great to just chat with you specifically because we have that history. Um, So it's been great. Yeah, awesome. Want to keep the conversation going? You can visit our podcast hub, usertesting.com slash podcast and check out past episodes. If you haven't already, don't forget to follow us on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, or Google Play, so you can never miss a good episode. And if you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend or leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts.